Thank you very much. I'll be talking about side effects comparing different integrase inhibitors and different integrase regimens. These are my disclosures. So I'll be covering adverse events or AEs. And actually the main focus of my talk will be on some of the challenges of capturing and interpreting adverse events, because I think the key principles are in some way more important than some of the data that I'll be presenting about individual drugs. Two points I want to pull out from the beginning. Some adverse events are very objective, such as measuring liver enzyme elevations, Others are much more subjective, such as capturing nausea. And what is statistically significant may not necessarily be clinically important. I'll then be touching on the question about whether INSTEs or integrases are better tolerated as a class, and then looking at some comparisons between individual INSTE agents. Firstly, clinical trials can be hard to interpret. Differing baseline demographics, the underappreciated impact of the placebo effect, clumsy adverse event reporting and subjective interpretation. And I will give examples of each. Let's take the example of lipids and baseline characteristics. Now lipids and the change in lipids from baseline are a common safety endpoint in clinical trials. However, lipids at baseline will vary in different populations. Examples are the fact that a higher viral load is associated with a lower LDL, and older age is associated with a higher total cholesterol. Here's an example. Start Merck is a first line study using a tenofovir backbone comparing raltegravir with efavirenz. Efavirenz is associated with greater lipid elevations than raltegravir, but even raltegravir is associated with small increases in lipids from baseline. Let's now look at the DRIVE studies and focus on the right at DRIVE ahead, which is a first line comparison of Doravirine and Efavirenz. On Efavirenz, as you'd expect, you're seeing elevations in lipids, but apparently quite uniquely for Doravirine, we're seeing a reduction in some lipid parameters. So can we conclude that Doravirine has a better lipid profile than Raltegravir? I'd argue it's impossible to conclude that because the baseline characteristics differ so markedly. So there was a much higher proportion of people in the Raltegravir study who had a low CD4 or a high viral load. And if high viral load is associated with a lower LDL, then that's hard to interpret the LDL change on start Merck as compared to drive. The other thing that differed was age, so 32 median age for drive ahead and 37 for start Merck. And this is to be expected, I think, because start Merck was undertaken in an era when we tended to defer antiretroviral therapy, whereas drive ahead is from an era where we start treatment much sooner. Placebo. This is best illustrated, I think, by the Gilead 102 and 103 studies for Strybuild. In one, the 102 study, Strybuild was compared with efavirenz, and in 103 with boosted atazanavir. Now this graph is showing us the proportion of people with abnormal dreams. Now this is a great way of showing adverse events because rather than just showing the proportion of people experiencing the adverse event at year one, we're looking at how many people have the adverse event at any given time point. That's the point prevalence shown on the line. And the bars along the bottom show the incidence. So what proportion of people are getting that side effect for the first time? And this is a great way of showing adverse events so we can counsel patients when they're starting treatment. But back to the placebo point, the top red line are abnormal dreams in people who are on efavirenz. Then next down, you've got Strybuild. The gray line towards the bottom is atazanavir, and the yellow line is also Strybuild. So you see a big difference between Strybuild abnormal dreams rates between the two studies. And of course, in 102, where abnormal dreams were more common on Strybuild, because it was a blinded study, people knew they might be on efavirenz. Now, this explains the difference, because in 103, where people weren't expecting to get abnormal dreams, the rates were much higher. So a really good demonstration of the impact of placebo. By clumsy reporting, I mean just reporting the prevalence of side effects at week 48, for example. And I've already shown you how much more meaningful and more detailed graph is. Let's take an example. 
If I said to you, do you want to take drug A with a 50% chance of diarrhea or drug B with a 5% chance of diarrhea? I imagine most of you would opt for drug B. But now let's think about the duration as well. So let's imagine drug A, it's much more likely you'll get diarrhea, but it only lasts for two days. Whereas drug B with the only 5% risk, but if you do get it, it lasts for a whole year. I imagine most of you would now opt for A. So that's where graphs like the Stribuild studies are so important because we can counsel people more accurately about how long an adverse event is likely to last. Causality, i.e. whether a drug-related adverse event is important or not, is decided by the investigator. And this can be difficult. In some studies, you have to say whether a side effect is related or not related. You don't have the options of probable or possible. There's also the bias of familiarity that we may be more likely to attribute an adverse event to a drug if it's an already known adverse event. Whereas if it's new, we may be less likely to decide that it's drug related because we're not familiar with that side effect. So I think optimal adverse event reporting would be incidence and point prevalence, as I showed you in that stride build graph, but also grading, breaking down those bars into grades one, two, three or four adverse events would be even more helpful. Reporting all as well as drug related adverse events so we can make our own decisions and more nuanced causality assignments so we do have those probable possible categories. I think clustering is something we should look at. So for example, if 90% of all people getting insomnia on a drug are the same people who get depression, that helps us when counseling patients. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, is the impact of these adverse events on activities of daily living and quality of life, which is captured through patient reported outcomes. And I think that should be standard in all trials. Second question, are INSTEs safer and better tolerated as a class? Now against protease inhibitors, I would say undoubtedly yes. And I think that's well illustrated by the ACTG 5257 study comparing boosted atazanavir, boosted darunavir and raltegravir first line all with a TDF FTC backbone. If we just look at that top line for any toxicity discontinuation, you can see 16% for atazanavir, 5% for darunavir, and just 1% for the integrase raltegravir. The other point to pull out here, of course, is boosted drugs also have that issue of indirect toxicity because of the risk of drug-drug interactions. And two good examples are the interaction between boosters and steroids, which can lead to iatrogenic Cushing's, and with statins, which can cause myotoxicity, such as rhabdomyolysis. What about against NNRTIs? It's a bit more difficult because there are few comparisons of integrases with modern NNRTIs. Certainly if we think about the NNRTI of Favarins, all core agents compare well from a CNS perspective. What about hepatotoxicity? Because there's been a suggestion in some cohorts that integrases may be less associated with hepatotoxicity. This is the Icona Italian cohort looking at liver enzyme elevations. You can see the details there but they looked at more than 180 liver enzyme elevations in more than 20,000 patient years of follow-up. And after adjustment, they showed this. So there was significantly less chance of liver enzyme elevation on an INSTE, which is the bottom line, compared to a PI or NNRTI, which are the overlapping top lines. Now, of course, this would be mainly older NNRTIs. Duravarine wouldn't have featured and rilpivirine use was likely low, but you are still seeing this class difference. Now, on the topic of liver enzyme elevations, when they are included as an endpoint in clinical trials, we often see the risk stratified by hepatitis B or C co-infection status. But I wonder now whether thinking about steatosis or fibrosis as a stratifier would be more meaningful. One example is this data from the IAS conference last year from a German cohort. And they looked at people starting integrases and the risk of ALT elevation. The thing to pull out, there was an association with comorbidities or concomitant meds, but there was an association with liver fibrosis. Overall, though, I think the fact that integrases are such a safe and well-tolerated class is one of the reasons that drives them being a preferred choice 
in consensus treatment guidelines. So the latest version of the EACS guidelines, as well as last year's update to the DHHS guidelines, now only include unboosted integrase-based regimens as the preferred first-line options. One issue, of course, for integrases is weight gain. This is the SACS analysis of eight first-line Gilead trials as an example, and demonstrates the fact that integrase inhibitors, and here that's BIC, dolutegravir, and elvitegravir, all associated with a greater risk of significant weight gain than efavirenz, whereas for atazanavir, there was no difference. And of course, there are numerous cohort and clinical trials showing our second generation integrases and TAF, both particularly associated with weight gain. Now, Doravarine as our newest NNRTI may be associated with numerically less weight gain than the integrases. I think we need to understand better about the characteristics that are driving this. And I'll come back to this graph later on for another reason. But one thing to consider though, is the impact of fat gain in terms of other metabolic risks. And this data presented at the Glasgow conference by Giovanni Guaraldi did detailed DEXA and CT scans on people gaining weight. And actually people gaining weight on an INSTE gained fat that may be healthier than the fat that people on non insti regimens gain. So this idea that some fat is more inert and less inflamed compared to fat with fibrosis and cytokine production that may be more harmful in terms of metabolic endpoints is an interesting one. And I think we'll start to understand a lot more about weight gain, not just in terms of fat quality, but also distribution and the long-term risks that it has. Finally, let's think about comparing different INSTEs. I'm gonna focus on two key integrase-related issues. One is CNS toxicity, the other is metabolics. I'm going to pull out the importance of other regimen components and the importance of baseline regimen when looking at switch results. So CNS toxicity, in particular mood and suicidality, have been listed as issues for integrases. And this is a summary of the summary of product characteristics for different integrase regimens. And what we see here is suicidal ideation or suicide attempt are uncommon across the board. But for raltegravir in particular, they advise caution when using the drug in people with a pre-existing history of depression or psychiatric illness. Now, again, I think it's fair to say that all of these drugs where they've been compared against efavirenz, for example, do fare much better, but it is a class toxicity that's highlighted in the EACS guidelines as well. This is some data from a German cohort looking at the risk of discontinuing an integrase inhibitor for a neuropsychiatric adverse event. And what you see here is you are significantly more likely to discontinue dolutegravir than elvitegravir or raltegravir. But of course, one of the problems here is the issue of confounding as a cohort. And were there reasons that people may be on dolutegravir, which is the higher barrier unboosted option of the three compared to elvitegravir or ral? The other thing to pull out though, is where people on dolutegravir did discontinue for neuropsychiatric side effects. That was more likely if they were female, if they were older, but also if they were starting a back of it at the same time. And this a back of it signal is an important one. Let's look again at 1489 and 1490. These are the Gilead registrational studies for BIC Tarvi. 1489 compared BIC FTC TAF with dolutegravir, a back of it, and lamivudine, or BIC Tarvi versus Triomec. And look at the differences in nausea and insomnia rates, both more common in a dolutegravir arm. Now you could look at that and say, well, dolutegravir is less well tolerated than bictegravir. However, if we look at 1490, an almost identical study, but here dolutegravir was also given with a TAF FTC backbone. So it's a cleaner comparison of the two integrases. Now you can see those two particular adverse events are very similar in the two arms. So this is telling us it was the abacavir in 1489 that was driving those differences, not the difference in integrases. And that probably should be expected because these two drugs are molecularly very, very similar. That's Bictegravir on the left and Dolutegravir on the right. Now, of course, there are some differences. A good example is the impact they have on metformin exposure 
they both increase metformin exposure, but dolutegravir to a greater degree. So there are some differences, but really it's unlikely there'd be any major differences in safety and tolerability based on their structure. And let's think about now some real world data. So how does dolutegravir fare in real world data? Now this is a summary of some real world studies including more than 1600 patients, but let's look specifically at real world discontinuations. And this is a summary of different studies and you can see across the board discontinuation rates between six and 8%. How does that compare with Bictegravir? Well, we've got data again from Glasgow presented earlier this month. Bicteg Bicstar is a real life cohort from Germany, Canada, France and the Netherlands. And they included 430 treatment experience patients. And I'm focusing on treatment experience because the last graph was also in suppressed switch settings. Now you can see these are the regimens people on at baseline. So mainly integrases for the core agent and mainly TAF the backbone. And this is looking at discontinuations from Bictegravir after 12 months. And let's look at the bottom for the treatment experience group that was just under 8% at month 12. And if we look specifically at drug related adverse event discontinuations, again, on the bottom line of this table, it was 7%. So what we're seeing here are similar adverse event discontinuation rates for dolutegravir and mivudine as for Bictegravir and FTAF. So I think similar to 1490, these two integrases are performing similarly. Now let's come back to weight gain. And here I think it's fair to say that both Bictegravir and Dolutegravir are associated with more weight gain than other third agents. But here again, backbone becomes important. And in 1489, where Dolutegravir was given with a Bacavir rather than TAF, there was numerically less weight gain. What about Gemini, where we saw Dolutegravir with a Lamivudine only backbone or TDF? Now you can see this less weight gain for TDF. And that's consistent with other studies where TDF is associated with less weight gain. Indeed, some people would argue with weight loss. For Dolutegra and Lamivudine, you're seeing three kilos at two years, so fairly similar to some of the TAF-based results. However, please note that the 1490 and 1489 studies on this graph show median weight change, whereas Gemini and Advance on the far right show mean. And here I'll bring back that Duraverine graph. Here is the mean change over week 48 and week 96 for the Duravarine studies. And here is the median. And actually, because mean is more likely to be skewed by outlying results, median may be more accurate. And you can see that the median change was less for Duravarine than mean. So that's really important when thinking back to this other slide, comparing Dolutegravir and Mivudine with Dolutegravir and TAF. And of course, it's not just about weight. Are there differences in integrases in terms of other metabolic parameters such as lipids? And the answer is probably not. And it is mainly coming down again to backbone. Now, Tango, where people on suppressive TAF-based therapy either continued or switched to dolutegravir and mivudine, you can see there were significant improvements in lipids for people who were on a booster at baseline, but not on those who weren't. So I think what we're showing here is removing TAF only didn't yield big changes in lipids, but removing TAF and a booster on the left did. And again, this is really highlighting the importance of other components in a regimen and shows us how challenging it is to compare drugs if other components differ. Similar for insulin resistance, so insulin resistance improved significantly overall and for the boosted subgroup in Tango, but not for the unboosted group. And I want to just finish on one very new paper about insulin sensitivity. And this is the screenshot from Medscape proclaiming that HIV drugs may be protective against type 2 diabetes. And actually what they showed in cohorts is people with HIV or Hep B on NRTIs saw less type two diabetes development than people not on NRTIs. And in fact, 
The authors showed that lamivudine restores insulin sensitivity in human cells from people with type 2 diabetes. So actually, NRTIs are being used as a basis for a new drug class that's being explored to treat diabetes. Now, here again, it's important to think about backbone. And rather than necessarily comparing individual integrases, we need to think about whole regimens. And if indeed lamivudine in particular is associated with insulin sensitivity improvements, that's an argument for using lamivudine as a backbone with integrase as we, as we think about which options are going to be best for our patients in the longer term. So to conclude, the evolution of antiretrovirals has undoubtedly led to marked improvements in toxicity and tolerability. And I didn't show you data from the older protease inhibitors and NNRTIs demonstrating that. But I do think incidence and point prevalence should be standard when describing adverse events in trials. And we must bear in mind that as adverse events get less common, post-marketing surveillance is all the more important. And as new toxicities emerge, such as weight gain, understanding the mechanisms is crucial so we can use those mechanisms to study the risk of that adverse events from other drugs in the same class. So I'll finish there by thanking you for your kind attention.